Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, yeah. They start in. Um, so glad to see so many of you back. Um, can we sure stop what... talking so we can hear the speaker? Thank you. <laughs> um, Girl Scout leader. Not sure why, why the, like the back rows are oh, so, so, so attractive, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you're fine. So, um, well, the soft seats are attractive. Too. Yeah, the others really, yeah, premier soft seats up front. But uh, all right, well, let's get started. And um, uh, so last week we talked about sort of the earliest history of Christmas and, and how we arrived at you know, the, the, the dates and things that we, we rely on today. So I thought, actually, a good way to start. You're still not going to tell us how this ends until the very end, right? <laughs> okay, well, I thought we could do a little pop quiz on last oh, week. Quiz. Okay, so, and for those of you who weren't here, a little bit of a review to catch up. So, all right, so first of all, which of the four Gospels have the story of Jesus' birth? And there were two of them, Matthew and Luke, very good, that's right. And so number two, well, there you, you get one of the names there, does Matthew, does Matthew give the names of the three kings bearing gifts? No. no. And in fact, um, don't think they're even called kings. Wise men? So, okay, true or false? First century Romans had midwinter celebrations in mid to late December. True. true, very good. True or false? In the early Middle Ages, Northern European Yule was a midwinter Christmas party. True, yes, so not Christian yet, but yeah. Um, let's see. True or false? The Romans had a sun god whose birth was celebrated on December 25th. True. True. Yep, exactly. And then, about how many years after Jesus' birth is the first Christmas on December 25th documented? Um, I think it was 350. Oh, I was going to say. Yeah, that's yeah. So, so it took 350 years before we really get like the first references to December 25th being the day. Uh, and then, you know, but it's, it, records are so spotty, you know, it's hard to know what was really going on and what the exact dates would be. But it is interesting that there's no uh, known reference to December 25th for Jesus' birth, you know, that we know about earlier than that. So, how, how does that interface with Constantine and, and his acceptance of Christianity? Um, oh, um, I would think that it would go hand in hand with it. That with 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 Christmas and with Constantine making it legit, you know, it makes sense. Then there would be more sort of, you know, political and cultural will behind. Um, are we getting more bells? Than we yes. Or, yes. Or, yes. Kind of goes with Christmas. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Well, in this festive atmosphere, did we pass? Yeah, yeah, we did well, right? Good job. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the way. I think. Talk to him. So, um, okay, this is just like kind of a minute of review. We actually look okay. Oh, okay. So, well, we're talking about Christmas, you know, so it's kind of you know, like like opening music or whatever for us. Uh, all right. Switch. Thank you, sir. Thank all you, Ryan. Right. <laughs> so, so remember this weird story about um, there was an English Benedictine monk Boniface, missionary to Germany, who you know reportedly um, basically chopped down the heathen oak dedicated to the Norse god Thor. Um, and then that tree, that spot, instead, they planted uh, a young fir tree 
evergreen, you know, uh, for the Christ child. So essentially replacing one tree with another. And this is actually typical of encounters between Christians and existing pre-Christian you know, other religious practices. Um, is, uh, and, and so what Christmas uh, is sort of, you know, the way it operated was that, um, that the, the, uh, the sort of the, the powers that be promoted Christmas picked up, used, adapted elements and symbols from existing cultures and peoples keep the customs, but sort of put new meanings. Because people have traditions and customs that they like. If they can keep those, but you know, you switch out what what it's about, it's a you know, it's a good good way to sort of bring Christianity um, um, to to the, the people voluntarily. Um, and there's a cool quote that I wanted to read to you. By the way, this is this is the book that most of my talk is based on, Christmas, A Candid History by Bruce David Forbes. Pretty good one. Um, and he has this great quote um, from um, Gregory the Great about this idea of coming in and proselytizing by sort of um, uh, uh, you know, subsuming existing cultural images, practices, icons, things like that. Um, so this is from um, a writing of uh, Pope Gregory. Um, the idle temples of the English race should by no means be destroyed, but only the idols in them. Take holy water and sprinkle it in these shrines, build altars and place relics in them. When this people see that their shrines are not destroyed, they will be able to banish error from their hearts and be more ready to come to the places they are familiar with, but now recognizing and worshiping the true God. So, right, keep the building, switch out the... You know, the God. <laughs> the God. Um, and a little farther down, do not let them sacrifice animals to the, de the devil, but let them slaughter animals for their own food to the praise of God, and let them give thanks to the giver of all things for his bountiful provision. So, um, yeah, pretty cool, right? I mean, so that was really a, that was kind of a clever strategy, I guess you could say. I mean, if you can't win them over by, you know, force and beheading and stuff, well, all right, so let's carry on with... Uh, David, Yeah. coming from anthropology, if you go into any group, it doesn't matter if it's very primitive or more advanced, uh -huh. the hardest thing to change is religion. Oh, yeah, I believe that. That is what, you know, the, the, what is solid about right. the group. Right, everybody here, Sandy, the hardest thing about coming in and encountering, uh, you know, a different cultural group uh, the hardest thing to change is essentially the religion, the beliefs. And it makes sense, right? I mean, your beliefs are kind of what you're all about. So the idea of, of abandoning those um, is, is a challenge. So, um, all right. Um, hang on. This is, this is jumping around a little bit more than I wanted to. Okay, so here we go. So about the Christmas tree. So Pope Gregory... The Great uh, established this policy of, um, uh, of accommodation with native traditions in spreading the Gospels, like we just read. Um, and so, if, if you sort of look for, if you if you look for things like Christmas trees, like where, where do you find them? Like when when did people start doing stuff like that? Um, well, Christmas tree traditions are especially, especially rich and varied and known from Germany in the 1600s. Um, Martin Luther was, was a fan, uh, apparently, which that would help a lot. Um, German royalty then, essentially, you know, uh, royal families throughout Europe tended to intermarry and so on. Uh, so German royalty took trees to Austria, France, and England. And then, uh, you know, somewhat later, Germans in America sort of brought that tree tradition. So it's, it's primarily a German 
you know, kind of insight or innovation or, or uh, uh, tradition, as far as that goes. In the Americas, especially in, say, 1840s, 1850s. No, David, the picture is very interesting because if you go to Martin Luther's study, uh -huh. his actual room, the door is right there, the stove is in the left corner still, so whoever. Did so, that, this is actually what it looks like when you go visit there? Looking and, out in the table. The nice. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, right. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't remember that. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. And you see, um, he's got it, right? I mean, like the tree, some candles on there. Hope you don't burn the house down. Yeah. Some little presents and stuff. And But, but importantly, um, this is as imagined by an illustrator in the 1800s, right? So this is sort of a potentially a sentimentalized, imaginative uh, sort of depiction. Not necessarily. Yeah, it's on that door that Peter the Great signed his name, and you can still see it. Oh, cool. Yeah. You gotta go there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right. So more about the Christmas tree. So many slash most homes in America were doing this by the second half of the eighteen hundreds, and there was also kind of then a shift in relationship to the the gift practices, you know, that, that kind of were coming along with it. Um, it sort of went from, from a small tree on a small round table decorated with small gifts to larger trees often on the floor with larger numbers of gifts, right? So it's sort of a, a trend, you could say. Um, and it's kind of an interesting little footnote. Um, in Japan, um, and I'd never known this before, but um, uh, after World War II, um, they widely adopted Christmas trees, gifts, ornaments, all the Christmas bling. They loved it. Uh, and um, basically, I mean, not converting to Christianity. They just love all that Christmas stuff. Um, so, you know, a non-Christian context, sort of a cultural appropriation. But, you know, I mean, it's all in good fun, right? So, so um, the... Um, the the, the Japanese have, um, you know, the Japanese flag, and here we have some Christmas ornaments and, and, uh, and greenery on there, and some, some Christmas shopping in the lower right, and, um, you know, my personal favorite, the Japanese KFC with Colonel Sanders as Santa Claus, so, I mean, talk about decadence, right, like, wow. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, other, other, you know, things about uh, vegetation that doesn't die off in winter. Um, well, uh, there are other plants that stay green in winter that, well, lo and behold, have been, become kind of part of our tradition. Um, so, European uh, mistletoe, um, it's uh, basically a parasitic evergreen plant that grows on or in trees. And there's actually many um, species worldwide. I mean, we had a lot of it in California, where I grew up, for example. Um, um, but culturally, it has been associated with fertility, peace, love, life. Um, it was hung over Roman doorways, mistletoe over the doorways for protection. And of course, later, you know, we know, right? The mistletoe over the door. Uh, and, uh, and, a bonus, it offers protection from witches and demons. Uh, and then um, in a similar vein with holly, there are many species of that. Uh, conventionally has been associated with Christmas from early on. In particular, um, uh, like a nice kind of way to, to you know, adapt holly uh, to, your, to your Christian way of thinking is you can think of the pointed leaves. Well, that's the... Uh, that's Jesus, like Jesus's crown of thorns, right? The stickery points on the leaves and the red berries, drops of Jesus's blood. So, you know, Christians are quite imaginative when it comes to, you know, sort of thinking of meanings, uh, spiritual meanings and things you can see and touch and are around you. Um, and this is kind of an interesting story that I haven't realized either. Um, the, the, the red plant that we called poinsettia. I grew up saying poinsettia. Yeah. So, but, um, but that is not an old 
word at all. It's a, there's a plant native to Mexico who's known to the Aztecs, and this plant is, you know, sort of another sort of perfect symbol for Christmas. Um, the plant comes to full bloom in December, responding to darkness. Perfect, right? Um, and it was brought to the U.S. Um, in 1825 by the U.S. ambassador and amateur botanist, one Dr. Joel Roberts. So that's where the name came from, which, I mean, I have no idea. Uh, and it would, you know, I mean, look at it. It's so awesome, so beautiful. No wonder it became pervasive in the U.S. by the late 1800s and, of course, into the 20th century and, and today. Um, now, also, it's kind of uh, interesting to note that not all Christians have liked this Christmas business. Um, notably, the Puritans, the conservative Church of England faction, you know, like the ones that burned witches. Um, the Scottish have not been real big on it. Presbyterians um, suppressed Christmas in England and New England in the mid-1600s. But I guess we got over it. <laughs> I was going to say the Scottish have a problem with drinking. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Seeing it as too Catholic, not biblical enough. Which, I mean, it's true. Uh, you know, it's not that biblical, a lot of this stuff we do. Um, and they thought that it did promote immoral behavior like parties and drinking and stuff, so we can't have that. Um, and um, it, just also, just as a general observation, um, it seems that Quakers, Baptists, and Methodists also de-emphasized Christmas, you know, for, I mean, I think they all celebrate it now. But, you know, as far as sort of who, who, who were early adopters versus who kind of came along later, it's not, it's not a real cut and dried, simple uh, story. Yeah, the pilgrims, too, they didn't celebrate it. Sure, sure. Yep, yep. Yeah. All right. So, but in America, um, <clears throat> Many Dutch, German, and Scandinavian colonists, um, Lutherans, Catholics, Dutch Reformed, Anglicans, embraced Christmas. Um, and in the early United States, um, you know, some people observed it, um, some did not. Um, and in fact, this was an interesting statistic that the U.S. Congress met on Christmas Day, so it was a work day, every year from 1789 to 1855. So, by 1855, Christmas was enough of a thing that they took the day off. So, you know, it's it's kind of an odd little statistic, but but it kind of tells you something about the mentality, the mindset, the outlook of people um, on, on, you know, on this uh, uh, holiday. And so there was, you know, you might say something like a Christmas revival um, um, in England and the U.S. in the mid-1800s. And so... Um, Let's look at the England stuff a little bit, because there's some, some interesting and probably familiar touch points for us. Defining modern Christmas in England. Um, I think we all know the name Charles Dickens. Um, wrote, of course, the, the very famous novella, A Christmas Carol, in 1843, which presented, of course, Scrooge and, I mean, I think we all, we all know the story. And it also became very popular um, in so that, that helped that helped the cause of Christmas as we know it. Then um, there were Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Now Victoria came to the English throne in 1837, but part of her background was German. So, ah, German, Christmas tree. And indeed, she imported sort of the German Christmas tree to have, you know, in the royal setting in England. And um, on December 23rd, 1848, in the Illustrated London News, there was this, um, this image that you see on the right that, I mean, probably they didn't plan, plan or foresee or whatever, but that image became very widespread, very popular. People really saw that and resonated with it because you can see the royal family there um, and they don't look really regal and noble. They just look like a nice family, you know, presumably mother and father and, you know, the children around the Christmas tree. You've got um, the evergreen tree. It's got ornaments. 
Um, it's got uh, candles, and um, there are, seem to be little presents underneath, um, perhaps for the children. It's sort of hard to see. Uh, not wrapped, not gift wrapped. That, that, that didn't quite happen, I think, at that point. But, but this image sort of you know, went around the world and really you know, kind of uh, uh, gave the, the, the Christmas movement a shot in the arm, you might say. And so, so it, it sort of engendered this notion of a, you know, a Victorian Christmas centered on family and home, and not necessarily church or Jesus, but just family and home. So now, let's shift gears. Okay, so we've got that sort of English, um, um, you know, sort of factor in the development of Christmas. Now let's talk about uh, a case of American innovation, Santa Claus. And there's a, there's several kind of weird little elements that contribute point by point to the creation of Santa Claus. And um, so let's let's proceed. First of all. There was a Saint Nicholas who was a fourth century, so okay, so 300s AD, long, long, long time ago, Bishop of Myra in what would today be southwestern Turkey, um, little known as a person, but was much loved as a, as a legend throughout um, Europe and Eastern Europe, Russia. Um, this Saint Nicholas is associated with uh, children with gift giving um, and serves as kind of a guardian angel figure for children. And St. Nicholas's day, like the saint's day in honor of him, is December 5th. So, you know, we're kind of in the zone, right, for, for Christmas. Um, and among his European names, um, St. Nicholas, and you know, depending which language and how they spell it, the D Dutch um, was um, Sinterklaas. Uh, and sometimes, then, the legend would have it, Saint Nicholas, in doing things for children, would come along with the Christ child, a uh, German Christkindl. So, um, so the English Chris, from, from Christkindl, try, try saying Christkindl three times fast. <laughs> Christkindl, Christkindl, Christkindl. Christkindl. Uh, um, it's not hard to get to Chris Kringle, Chris Kringle. So this um, essentially later in the U.S. merges as another name for Santa. Okay, so we have Saint Nicholas, also known as Sinterklaas, and coming with the Chris Kringle, Chris Kringle, uh, and never mind that later they will merge, right? Santa Claus is Chris Kringle, right? They aren't, they aren't, but, but it didn't start that way. It was these two legendary, you know, figures. So, um, so Protestant settlers in America remember St. Nicholas, um, especially um, uh, with the um, uh, New York City being so heavily Dutch, you know, settled and influenced. It's not surprising. So anything that, that lands as a cultural force in New York City has a pretty good chance of you know, being influential throughout the U.S. And so anyway, so, so, so let's look at that. We've got our steps to um, uh, notable American figures to get at our, our Santa Claus as we know him today. Okay. So again, sort of disparate little stories and anecdotes <laughs> that were influential in the history. Number one, we had um, John, <coughs> John Pintard, 1759 to 1844, of the New York Historical Society, who <coughs> uh, recognizes and sort of promotes, you know, Dutch heritage in New York, you know, city and state of New York, and sees St. Nicholas as an emblem for that Dutch history. So St. Nicholas is kind of being held out there. Um, now, Washington Irving, 1783 to 1859, pop popularized this Dutch-based St. Nicholas in his history of New York and uh, saying things about St. Nicholas like uh, he flew over trees 
and slid down chimneys <coughs> to deliver gifts. I mean, that sounds familiar. I mean, who could be against, you know? I, I don't know, that whole sliding down chimneys, you know, I mean, when, when I grew up, I mean, our first house, it did have a fireplace, but I mean, I'd kind of look up that chimney and like, it's just, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. That, you'd have to be a shapeshifter or something to get down that. And our, our current house doesn't even have a chimney. So I guess we're out of luck, um, according to Washington Irving. But. Leave the door unlocked. Exactly, there you go. Um, okay, number three, we've got Clement Moore, 1779 to 1863, or Henry Livingston, 1748 to 1828. It's a little, I, I don't know the intricate details, but it's kind of questionable slash controversial who actually wrote The Night Before Christmas. I think Clement Moore is popularized as the author, but there's there's this question about this other writer who maybe actually wrote it, but never mind, that's beyond what we need to look at today. Um, the Night Before Christmas came out um, in 1823, and what it introduces is sleigh, reindeer with names, um, no Santa Claus yet, but Saint Nick. Saint Nick comes on Christmas Eve, not December 5th. Remember, December 5th was actually his kind of saint's day. Um, and remember also, and this part doesn't fit with the modern view, that in the poem, Santa is a very small stature, right? An elf, right, jolly old elf. Um, tiny reindeer, like so you get the idea of a really tiny, tiny figure and, you know, of the size where, in fact, you might actually be able to make it down that chimney. <laughs> but, but, well, but, but, uh, yeah, so, so Santa Claus, Saint Nick, Saint Nick um, started out small and, and sort of grew, seemingly, um, um, through the decades of the 1800s. Okay, number four, Thomas Nast, 1840 to 1902, was um, a Harper's Weekly cartoonist and um, basically worked with the Dutch Sinterklaas, you know, that material, um, and sort of uh, produced terms, phrases like Santa Claus, old Santa Claus, Santa Claus, you know, Santa Claus. So that's, you know, kind of step by step, sort of by, by you know, not quite getting the Dutch right and so on, we arrive at... Santa Claus. And moreover, then, Nash establishes its jolly bearded with North Pole headquarters with elves as assistants and then accepting letters from children. So, so Thomas Nast, as far as just the writing and the cartoon, the, the sort of cartoonish depictions, he had a huge influence, huge impact. Uh -huh. Was he Dutch in New York? Was he established, or was he in, it says Thomas Nash, Dutch. Is he Dutch or Santa oh, oh, sorry, no, no. When I say Dutch there, I mean that the Dutch Sinterklaas oh, no. become, yeah, yeah, so. so he's American. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I actually I don't know too much about him personally, but yes. Yeah, so. This is kind of like the Christmas story, though, you know, because um, the, the accounts aren't the same. They, they add different things. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, yeah, right? We had the... The, the birth of Jesus in the two Gospels, and they're really different stories. Almost as if they didn't actually really have all the facts, and so they were motivated to provide some divine backing to this story they were putting together. So, uh, so David, yeah. where, where did leaving the tree up for Santa come from? Leaving the tree. Oh, a treat. I don't know about that, actually. Anybody have any insight? But that was a thing. When you're growing up, like, leave out a cookie, you know, and then, like, your mom or dad actually eats it or whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, good good question, but I did not encounter that one. It the, could be Pillsbury. <laughs> it's true. Yes, actually, some, something like that would make a lot of sense, right? I mean, commercialism has a lot to do with Christmas, and so some prominent ads, uh, like Coca-Cola. I mean, you know, if you can promote certain practices that move their product, 
they're going to do it. So, all right. Um, now, person number five of interest to us, and I think you've all heard, you know, you know about this, this text. Um, a newspaper editorial he wrote um, in um, 1897. Remember this thing where this young girl famously wrote a letter to the editor asking, is there a Santa Claus? To which the response, of course, was, yes, there is a Santa Claus. And um, I've, I've kind of got it on the slide there to the right, but it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's really small print, perhaps. And, and of course, we all know, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. And, you know, so, so, yeah, sort of Santa Claus of the heart. So, so that, that, that one editorial that Francis Church, again, was, was a small text that had, you know, had outsized impact uh, just on the psyche of American um, Christmas recognitions, I guess. Um, so Santa Claus imagery was pervasive by the late 1800s. Um, yeah, John, I like that, uh, Virginia. Your little friends were wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Those, those friends saying, there is no Santa Claus. Um, you know. Well, the bottom line that we can see is not believe in Santa Claus, you might as well not believe in fairies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, anyway, all right, very good. Um, and then the last thing I was going to highlight was there's this um, Haddon Sunblown, 1899 to 1976, commercial artist who basically helped to uh, seal the deal with Santa, um, essentially kind of standardizing through annual ubiquitous Coca-Cola ads, right? Every year there was a new yeah. Coca-Cola painting with Santa and prominent placement of Coca-Cola. And um, so uh, there were these, I, I guess, every year, 1931 to 64. And so seeing that image on the right, Got it, right? The, the hat, the red hat with the, the, the white you know, tassel on the end, and he's really, you know, large and and has that big belt and big beard, and it's it's you know, it's like that's that's Santa, right? So, so so those are some of the prominent steps in um, getting Santa Claus worked out for Christmas. So so we've gone a long way from trying to nail down Jesus' birthday to the spread of Christianity and these different thoughts and ideas associated with church holidays and pre-Christian holidays and so on. So here we are. Um, so um, a few uh, notes on American Christmas in the Industrial Age. Um, roughly speaking, um, as I mean, as I've understood it. Um, gifts weren't really the focus before the 1800s. I mean, I mean there, there, I'm sure there were some, but, um, but nothing like what we have, have come to today. Um, so uh, it's fair to say that industrialization in the 1700s and 1800s promoted consumer culture, a precondition for massive gift-giving practices, right? So merchants essentially came to see holidays as gift-giving, selling, opportunities, um, Christmas cards, Christmas trees, wrapping paper, decorations, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and gift giving at Christmas um, reportedly increased sort of in the mid 1800s. Um, I mean, we saw that the, the English royal family with little gifts and, you know, you kind of kind of piece together. Um, this, this kind of stuff is hard to work out in, you know, I mean, in intimate detail, right? I mean, with, uh, with what, what happens in people's individual homes over the decades, you know. Um, so, um, so really, um, the, the shift um, in the late 1800s and into the 1900s became essentially manufactured and purchased gifts more than, you know, probably homemade. You might, you might get one special homemade thing from somebody and then, you know, five or six or ten other gifts or what have you. So, um, and I mean... Um, uh, there was, have been religious objections and concerns against over-commercialization, you know, put the Christ back in Christmas. But, I don't know, it's, it's all in good fun, I think. Um, and so, so wrapping up our exploration of, you know, what is Christmas and how did it get to be what it is today, 
Um, so remember, going back where we started was um, Jesus' birth in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew um, sort of aligned with pre-Christian Roman festivals. And eventually, after some centuries, rather than killing Christians, Rome embraced Christianity and arrived at this convenient date, the date that they honored Sol Invictus, the, the, the victorious sun god, December 25th. And so December 25th was sort of subsumed to Jesus' birthday by the 400s AD, let's say. And then we explored more today about just the contact with and adapting from non-Christian cultures and beliefs, such as Germanic trees. Um, and so we also looked at the invention of modern Christmas in the age of industrialization, 1800s, 1900s to today. Um, and really, um, more recently, conflation of Christian and greatly expanded se secular celebrations, um, like Santa Claus. And, um, and it's fair to say, I mean, you know, I'm always really interested in language and how language changes and stuff. But if you notice that in today's society, in popular media, on TV and stuff, what's the word for Christmas? The holidays. Plural. The holiday, right? So on TV, like, you know, holiday, you know, the gifts for the holidays. They, they, they really actively resist saying Christmas, but, but we all know. I mean, and that's kind of how language works, right? Is you, you know, um, um, but in that spread, there's like eight holidays. Exactly. It, yeah, it, it, right. And it is, it's convenient that it does encompass, you know, like Kwanzaa and, and, and Jewish holidays, and there are other holidays. So, I mean, there's there's an advantage to it as well. Um, and, um, yeah, and so we, um, and then with Advent, we focus on love, giving family, light, and community against midwinter darkness. So it's all good. It's a good time of year to have a celebration like this, even if we're not quite sure about it. Jesus is great. <laughs> so, so to, yeah, think, that's to conclude, yeah, um, this is actually, this was taken five years ago, and I, I actually haven't seen yet if they have their stuff out. They, they sold their house. Did they? Oh, oh, it's a regular lawn. Oh, my God. So this is a historic doc, you know, record here. They did so, that for years. Uh -huh, exactly, yeah, yeah. John. Well, uh, we always went by the offer to Bruce's Jesus. Uh, Whatever, okay. yeah. Yeah. near Jones, as everybody knows, uh, and I knew the doctor okay. yeah. that had the property the first time because I went to Jones. Yeah. It, it's just amazing. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. been there for so long, and there, now there's a house next door, yeah. as everybody knows. Very good, yeah. So, all right. Very good. David, yeah. do you know anything about um, the placement on the top of the tree? Like some people have a star, some people have an angel. Have you read anything about that? Not really. I mean, I, I think it's just part, you know, just when it comes to making a tree look good, mm -hmm. kind of makes sense to have something up there. Um, <laughs> and, and a star, like growing up, we always had a star, mm -hmm. which is sort of like, you star know, building. exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's perfect, right? You want to get it up high, top angel. of the tree and yeah. stuff. Yeah. We've had an angel, a star, um, you know, and uh, so... Well, with that, I think that concludes our. Yeah. Oh yes, and, and Anne brought a special Christmas item from another from tradition another country. to share. Um, Doug's sister and husband and family. Um, have, well, actually, Rob grew up in <coughs> Minnesota, and they farm yeah. fourteen hundred acres, although they're reti retired somewhat and they south. But anyway, it's very Swedish. St. Olaf College is there, and when the king and queen, every five years or whatever, come to the United States, they go to St. Peter, Minnesota, which, by the way, has one major highway, four-lane street going through it. <laughs> Everything else is very rural, and come to St. Olaf and all this. So there's two traditions um, in uh, Sweden and Scandinavia, and we got this at this uh, Scandinavian sweet shop, um, very nice shop there. Um, uh, one is Catholic. This is not the Catholic one. This is the Protestant one. Uh, this Catholic one 
is Saint Lucia, sometimes called Saint Lucy, and she is a martyr, 30, uh, 345 AD. She was a Christian that was being forced to marry a pagan. She refused. They first blinded her and then killed her. So her ceremony, or her um, holiday, is December 13th, and it is uh, 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 celebrated in Sweden. Not so much in Finland because they're Lutheran. <laughs> they're <laughs> Lutheran. Um, but she is the patron saint of the blind. Um, and uh, on the other hand, a lot of students came forward. The way we got her wrong, little girl. Uh, she is not a saint. This is the apple girl. And if you think about Sweden and Scandinavia in the wintertime, fruit would be a real retreat, probably having to be shipped in. So she is the little uh, apple girl, see a basket with apples, and she carried, oh, by the way, St. Lucia is in a white gown with a big red sash and has a crown of lit candles on her head. Ooh. Yeah, that's not too dangerous, is it? <laughs> <laughs> this one has a little... And actually, you can get postcards, much fancier looking whatever, from uh, um, Elsa. What is it? E T S A S Y. That's it. That's it. They have postcards with this little figure on it uh, for Christmas. Anyway, so she would deliver an apple in the stockings of the children at Christmas time. So that's the story of the apple girl. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So not Santa Claus, but apple girl. Yeah. Right. right. Pardon? Did they call her Apple Girl? Or That's the only name I, I saw was Apple Girl. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was sure. great. So, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, I think that the Chris, Christmas traditions and imagery um, are, are rich and cherished in a way that really kind of fosters different regional or national practices and traditions. And so, you know, so even if we're sort of, Questioning, you know, the December 25th, questioning, well, what do we know about Jesus' birth? Well, you know, I mean, I think that um, that we've gotten to December 25th as sort of a, a rallying point to remember Jesus' birth and remember um, each other and family. And so if we view it as an opportunity to, uh, to love and treasure each other more, uh, it's all it's so much the better. So anyway, so... That concludes uh, my talk, and so thank thanks you. for coming. And, uh, <laughs>